this morning, and the title of this message is called Epic Fail. Epic Fail. I know this is a weird title for a sermon, but bear with me. This is part of the uh, book and the series, and as I was engaging in, in, in the study of this, it was just very, very eye-opening and enlightening um, as I was studying. In November of 1907, now this is a little bit of a story for you. In November of 1907, there was a pastor in Detroit, Michigan, who gathered a handful of Christians and started a church. They were very excited, and in his very first sermon, to the 163 people who were gathered in front of him, he shared his first sermon found in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 10. And it reads, Take heed now, Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. That was the, the verse that he based his sermon upon when he started a church. Immediately, the church being so excited, the new church gathered, they were so excited, they raised funds, and some of the richer members gave large sums of money. To the, uh, to the building fund, and in three years, three years, they were able to build this beautiful, magnificent building. And RC is about to show us the picture, there. <laughs> it's a beautiful Gothic structure, made with beautiful stone and wonderful stained glass. Isn't this beautiful? And it became one of the most beautiful, religious structures in all of Detroit. In all of Detroit. Now, so what they did was, people were so immediately attracted to this building, like if you were living during that time, this would be their mega church, and this was so attractive, people started to come in droves, even, from, even people from, from the suburbs and the outlying areas started to come to downtown Detroit just to attend services here because it was so beautiful. And, and in, like in six years, in six years, okay, this church had a membership of 1,325 people in six years. Now the population of Detroit was a little, a little smaller then, but for, for a church to be able to gather 1,200 people every Sunday is astonishing, it's amazing, right? In less than 10 years, this church attracted more than 2,000 people. Almost 25,000, 25,000, 2,500 people come regularly to worship services. In less than 10 years. In less than 10 years. Because people were just so attracted to this beautiful building. Now, Detroit started to change started to experience a cultural shift. African Americans from the South, because of segregation and discrimination, decided to migrate North, and a lot of them ended up in Detroit. This being in downtown Detroit, and they were so, so passionate about their holy huddle, they had nothing to do with the black people coming in. They just enjoy their way of life. Now, the problem was, a lot of the members eventually started moving to the suburbs. Because it was getting real crowded around downtown Detroit. What they did was, what the pastor suggested at that time was, hey, let's just, let's just sell this property and move to the suburbs. So that we can continue, quote unquote, our way of life. But the members of the church, the remaining members of the church, said, you know what, no, pastor. Because this has been our home for the longest time. Our parents sacrificed a lot in order for this church to be built. We are not moving. If you want to move, go start your church in the suburbs. They stayed but they still had nothing to do with the influx of people 
coming in from various parts of the state. And so by the 1960s, they had less than 400 members left. By the end of the 1980s, they had less than 200. And by 2005, when the last pastor passed away, the, the 11 remaining members of the great Woodward Avenue Presbyterian Church decided to shut down. The once glorious building turned into this. It's just... A mess. Plaster falling from the ceiling. There's another picture that Marcy will show you. It's a dumpster almost. Once the glorious, most beautiful church building in Detroit. Dead. Now, I don't want to judge the great Woodward Avenue church. But as I was doing my research, one of the very important factors stood out to that fact was the reason for the decline of the congregation was because from the very beginning all they wanted to build was a structure a monument for themselves and that is even reflected in the first sermon of the first pastor Church, I am calling you to build a house for the Lord. Literally, a house for the Lord. They started with the wrong focus. And when you start with the wrong focus, that is bound to fail. Truth is, each year, 6,000 churches in North America close its doors. Each year. 3,500 Americans leave the church each day. And I'm guessing it might be higher here in Canada. Might be higher. Only 9% of Christians give offerings weekly. And, and in our very own city, Lloydminster, less than 10% of the population regularly participate in a worship service like this. The church in North America is in decline. Whether you believe this or not. The greatest growth of the church is happening in places like Africa and China. What has happened? The North American Christian churches used to send most of the missionaries around the world. In fact, in the, the school, the missionary school, in Manila, called Faith Academy. It used to be overpopulated by Americans and Canadian missionaries and, and kids from those families. Now it's the majority of, of the student population is Korean. Koreans and Chinese. There's been a shift. Now you have to wonder why. Two weeks ago, we learned that when we pursue the presence of God and we are passionate about the glory of God, we will enjoy the goodness of God. We learned that. And the main point of this sermon this morning is this. When we lose our focus on God, we are doomed to fail. When we lose our focus on God, we are doomed to fail. Because Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says... We are surrounded by a great cloud of people or witnesses whose lives tell us what faith means. So let us run the race that is before us and never give up. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. And this is the verse that I want for us to focus on. Let us look only to Jesus, the one who began our faith and who makes it perfect. I told you about my visit to Indiana a couple of weeks ago. It's a beautiful church. They, the church that I visited was beautiful. But the most passionate person 
believe this or not, in evangelism and discipleship in that church is a Chinese girl. Chinese college student. Who received the Lord Jesus Christ through an Alpha course that she took in China. And that changed her world and her life and she received Jesus. She was never the same again. She moved to the States to study and lo and behold, God's been using her to disciple the Chinese students in Purdue University. They started with 30 people and when I visited them a few weeks ago, there were about 200. She was just so passionate about the discipleship and, and, and she came to me and said, Pastor John, I just want to share this with you. Our church, the church that I belong to, is so focused on so many things. They're just so spread out. And they're ineffective because of how, how thinly they've spread themselves over the city. Everything is a priority. And she said, I just want to go back to the point where we, where we make disciples, where we focus on Jesus. In fact, I think I told you that that church, when I was there, their biggest spring activity was to move mulch. To move mulch because it was spring and they just wanted to gather all the, the people to move mulch into the gardens. And I was like, where is the outreach element? Where is the evangelism element? Where is the discipleship element? To be frank with you, they invited me there to speak into their lives in that subject. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, look to Jesus. In the other version, the author and perfecter of our faith. The moment you lose your focus on Jesus, you will stray, you will get derailed, you will lose traction. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And like I said to you, the title of this message is Epic Fail. We will discover reasons why people in ministries and leadership fail. Keep your Bibles there and we will read through it. You see, while you're there, let me just share with you briefly the story. It was a time when Israel did not have a king. You remember our story from two weeks ago. Israel was freed from Egypt. God brought them to the promised land. And when they were taken there, when they, when they arrived in the promised land, they didn't have a king. And so God appointed judges to be leaders of the nation of Israel. And so while they were in Israel in the promised land, they didn't have a king. And like I said, God appointed judges, and eventually people appointed judges. And there was a judge named Eli who led Israel. He was godly, but he was also inconsistent. It's possible for a person to be godly and to be inconsistent at the same time, because we're imperfect people, right? Now, he had two sons. To very wicked sons. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 says this. The sons of Eli were worthless men who did not know the Lord. Would you want to be referred to as a worthless woman or a worthless man? Oh, my son is worthless. He just plays video games. Would you want to be referred to that way? Of course not. You want to be a person of worth. You want to have contribution. And, and according to this scripture, the sons of Eli, even though he was a godly man, he was inconsistent, and he was so busy with the work of the Lord, he was not able to raise his children properly. You see, during those days, at that time, an occupation or a profession is passed on dynastically or in the family. So if your dad was a carpenter, chances are, or most likely you are, and you will be the carpenter. Eli was a priest. And so no matter how wicked his sons were, 
They became priests. And the problem was this. They took advantage of the position that they were in. They were taking the offerings of the people and putting them in their pockets. They were, they were taking the, the meat offerings for themselves. Who, who wouldn't want steak? They would just take those. And, and according to scripture, they would even sleep with the women who welcomed people at the temple door. The ushers. That's how wicked the sons were. Now, the nation of Israel went into war. And while they were at war, of course, being people of God, they say, oh, we're going to win this. However, they were defeated. They were defeated at that battle. In fact, the Bible says they lost 4,000 men. And when they lost 4,000 men during that battle, what's very interesting is that the people asked this question found in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. Why did the Lord allow the Philistines to defeat us? Why did the Lord allow the Philistines to defeat us? You see, this verse, this verse teaches us that God does allow His people to experience failure and defeat. He allows it. Very clear. Failure can teach us a lot of things. But this failure was caused by the unwise and ungodly leadership that they had. And they did the most embarrassing mistake after this. You see, they were defeated. And they asked, why did the Lord allow the Philistines to defeat us? Oh, they said, I know what we could do. They said, let us take the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant. What is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is, is a chest described in Exodus. And there's a picture here um, about of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Described in, in scripture, this was a symbol of the presence of God in Israel. A holy, tangible symbol. They carried that everywhere to show that the presence of God was with them. And so the people who were in that camp said, oh, we were defeated. And so let's take this, Ark of the Covenant, the next time we fight. Let's take it with us. That way, we will never fail. We will never be defeated. And verse 3 says this, Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. I'd like for you to notice the word it. Take it, that it may Come among us. As soon as the ark entered the battle scene, the army of Israel rejoiced. They shouted loud and proud that the ark will give them victory. And that scared the Philistines. In fact, the Philistines thought, oh, God has come into our camp. They said, oh, no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of the mighty, these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Remember how we talked about the presence of God distinguishes the people of God? They were known all over that area to, have a, to having a God that is mighty, that is protecting them. And so when the, Israel, the people of the Philistines heard about the, the, the presence of God coming into the battle scene, they got scared. This is the same God that struck the Egyptians. But what happened? Verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were what? Defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost how many people? 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of the Covenant was captured, and Eli's two sons 
Afni and Phineas, or Phineas and Pop, died. Second failure that God allowed for them to experience. So when Eli heard the news, Eli the priest, he was overtaken by grief. He fell on his chair, broke his neck, and died. When the wife of Phineas, one of the sons, died, um, heard the news, she went into labor. And she died too, right after she gave birth to a son. But before the baby was born, verses 21 and 22 says this. <clears throat> She named the boy Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed for the ark of God has been captured. And then she died. Ichabod. The departure of the glory of God. Now, how do we lose our focus? What leads to an epic failure based on this story? First is when there is no genuine relationship with God. There is failure in ministry and failure in life. And there is no genuine relationship with God. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 12 says, The sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verses 12b to 13 says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, it is your relationship with God. It is a genuine relationship with God that keeps you going. If you have a genuine relationship with God, you will have some dry spells in your life. But you will always keep moving. We lose focus when, when personal agenda replaces God's vision. That's our next point. When personal agenda replaces God's vision, we lose our focus. In the case of Israel, that started in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And we read this. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Who cares what God thinks? This is what I want to do. I'll do it. I think my cousin's beautiful. I'm going to date her. It was just that messed up. Now, in those days, in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Personal agenda has taken over God's vision for them. God wanted to start a nation that will become a mighty witness to the power of God. What happened? I will do as I see fit. You see, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase, the law of diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns. You offer something and you get back a little less. The law of diminishing returns in our spiritual life starts with compromise, where accepting standards that are lower than is desirable takes place. You initially compromise. And then that leads to moralizing. You say, oh, okay, I've done it. Uh, what, making good out of something that is not. And eventually you will think, let's liberalize this. Let's just remove all the restrictions and loosen things up. Uh, they're not really bad. And then that leads to hedonism. You hedonize. Meaning you take pleasure or you find pleasure in something you shouldn't be doing. That is the law of diminishing returns. It starts with compromise and you end up 
hedonizing. What used to be wrong in your mind becomes right and pleasurable, and that is what happened to the people of Israel in the book of Judges. Third reason why we lose focus is that when, when faith is directed to a thing rather than to a person, who is God. First Samuel chapter 4 verse 3, let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant. And like I said, I made that word it bold. Is if you read in the NIV, it says that you or that he may come with us. But when you read the Hebrew original scriptures, it does not say he. It is referring to the thing. They have placed their faith upon a thing or in a thing. The presence of God, symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant, has become a lucky charm. And we all have succumbed somehow to the belief that there is such a thing as a lucky charm. Right? I once attended a revival meeting, and it's not from the same tradition as I come from, but it was a weird kind of tradition. And the pastor, while the pastor was preaching, they brought a man who was demon possessed. And the man just was convulsing in front of the people. And the pastor stood up and said, this is the word of God, it's powerful. Will you stand please, Mike? And they were holding the man, face the audience, they were holding the man tightly. And the pastor said, be gone with the power of the word, be gone. I was like, what in the world is this guy doing? <laughs> there is power in the word, but not in the paper. <laughs> this is not a lucky charm. When I was growing up, I was having real bad nightmares. And, and part of the nightmare was um, Batman was being eaten by a dragon. And you know what? One Sunday school teacher told me, you know what, Johnny, what you do? Put your Bible under your pillow when you sleep. That way you will never, ever have bad dreams. I did it. Batman was eaten by 17 dragons. <laughs> I was like, you lie! They have reduced the presence of God and the symbol of the presence of God to a lucky charm. Oh, let's take it. Let's bring it with us all the time so that we will be lucky. We will not experience defeat. What are the lucky charms in your life? Somebody came up to me a few weeks ago and said, you know what? Since I started coming to church, my business has flourished. The church is my lucky charm. <laughs> what are your lucky charms? What have you reduced God to? How do we lose focus? We direct our faith into a thing rather than a person. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. Literally set your minds upward. Not on earthly things. Your faith should be directed to God. I remember a story told to me by a friend of mine from Denmark who, at that point, knew a lot about the history of his denomination or his tradition. You see, he comes from, from the Church of Denmark. You see, the Church of Denmark, before, before it became Lutheran, used to be Roman Catholic. But when the king and queens of Denmark became Lutheran, they changed the affiliation of the church to Lutheran. And so, while he was pastoring a church in one of the little towns in Denmark, beautiful structure, by the way, he realized that some people who would come into the church, as soon as they get into the foyer, they would face a wall and bow. A blank wall. A blank wall. And for years he noticed that people did that. 
from the oldest to the youngest. And, and the youngest, the, the youngest of the, the flock would be taught, hey, I'll hear before you enter. Okay. And so it's been a tradition. And so he was even told, hey, pastor, you should bow before that wall. It's just tradition for us. Eventually, the church grew and they had to renovate. They had to knock down a portion of that wall. And when they chipped off the plaster out of, out of that wall, they saw an image of the Virgin Mary. What's interesting is, the church from Catholic to Lutheran changed its name and its denominational affiliation, and the people from Catholic to Lutheran, they never lost that tradition. That stayed on. To the point where we, somebody asked, what, why do you bow that wall? Well, it's just tradition. And then they realize the tradition is based upon thing. Do not reduce the presence, the glory, and the goodness of God to a thing. God is not a talisman. He is not a magical amulet. Fourth, we lose focus when what seem to be urgent priorities overshadow the main purpose. When what seem to be urgent priorities overshadow the main purpose. Acts chapter 1 verses 6b to 7 says, the disciple asked the Lord, disciples, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And he continues, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You see, the disciples were very much concerned with the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, but God said, Jesus said, that's not your concern. Your primary concern is missions. Your primary concern is that you tell the world that I am alive, that I am able to give people life again. Sometimes we get bogged down by things that seem to be urgent or priorities, and those priorities take over, overshadow the main purpose. A lot of people come to me at Mosaic, because we are a new church, and they say, Pastor, I have a program to propose. I have an activity to suggest. I have things to say and to teach. And I, I am just so glad that there are people who are like that. So, please keep coming if you have suggestions. But the leadership of this church, in its very young stage, has determined that we will filter activities, that we will filter suggestions. If it's not going to make disciples, we are not going to do it. If it will not contribute to the building up of the body, we will have to set that aside for some other time. We will keep our priorities straight. And right now, that is making disciples. You see, we lose our priorities for the main purpose when we build physical structures before we build disciples. When we prioritize programs over people. When we sacrifice before we obey. The Bible says to obey is better than to sacrifice. You sacrifice because you obey. You don't sacrifice because it just needs to be done. When we seek power over presence, and when we embrace systems before the Spirit. So how not to lose your focus? First is a declaration. I must love God with all of my heart. 
We lose focus when we, have, we do not have a relationship with God. We regain our focus. We do not lose our focus when we love God above all of our hearts. That is the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first commandment. All the other commandments hang on that first one, and the second was love your neighbor as yourself. Those two. Second, I will not lose focus if I live to be a better steward of God's goodness. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. All of us are gifted in various forms, and the grace of God comes in various forms. This is speaking about spiritual gifts, but if you take that to a broader sense, everything you have is a gift from God, and therefore you have to be, and you should be a good steward of all that you have, all that you have been entrusted to. You see, the first one that you have to be taking care of is your vertical relationship. And that is the main gist of this book, vertical. Take care of your vertical relationship. Are you focused solely on Jesus Christ? Second, are you a good steward of the gospel? You see, the gospel is good news. It's like discovering cure for cancer and you're keeping it to yourself. The gospel is a cure to death. You have to share it. Be a good steward of what you have, the gospel. Third is your horizontal relationships. Every relationship, every human relationship, you have to be a good steward of. You know, you know how they say, you know, every person in my life is there for a reason. You are in their lives for a reason. So you have to take care of that. How do I treat my wife? Am I a good steward of that relationship? How am I discipling my son or my daughter? How am I discipling? How am I treating my friends and my coworkers? Stewardship can be extended to that. And finally, your resources. Your material possessions. How do I not lose focus? I must learn God's way so I may do His will. 1 Samuel 2, 35 says, I will raise for myself a faithful priest, a leader who will, who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. According to what is in my heart. And mine. You and I must learn God's ways so that, I, that you and I will be able to do His will. Very important. The role of the priest, the role of the priest is to represent sinful people to a holy God and represent a holy God to sinful people. And God said, I will raise for myself a priest, a faithful priest. And in our belief as Christians, we are all priests. A what? We are all priests, according to scriptures. Everybody who has the presence of God, our role is to represent God to people. And it is also our role to represent our people to God. That is the role of the priest. Are you representing God to the people around you? And are you interceding for the people to God? Learn God's way so that he, you may do His will. Psalm 86, 10, uh, 11 says, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. An undivided heart, focused. Division is a combination of two words. Die, meaning two. Vision, meaning 
vision, or the way you see. To divide is to have two visions. David said, give me an undivided heart. Give me a focused heart that I may fear your name. And finally, how, not, how to not lose focus is this. I must lean on the God who never fails. Proverbs, one of my favorite passages of scripture, 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him or acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Lean on the God who never fails, not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in everything. And He will give you and provide for you a straight path. 